A welcome. It's still Thursday the 19th of August. Now I want to look at some more data from the UK today that's come in that's also quite encouraging. Very consistent with the data from Israel and the data from the United States, which is good. But first of all, I just want to give a bit of uh, context, uh, contextualization here. Now, here's the new cases. Now, New Zealand, very sad to learn. I think the current number of cases in New Zealand is 11 community acquired cases in New Zealand, and they've gone into a lockdown. So having done so well for the past year, now problems in New Zealand and, and all of the cases in New Zealand are Delta variant so far. Australia cases still increasing in New South Wales. Um, I really can't see the cases now in New South Wales falling to zero. I think this is going to be an ongoing problem until vaccination takes over now in Australia, sadly. And of course, Australia's got so little natural immunity, all the immunity that they have, essentially all the immunity they have is going to be from the vaccines. So that really is a, a sad, uh, sad situation in Australia, really. Canada case is going up gradually, despite very high vaccination rates. Netherlands, this is Netherlands here, nice dramatic reduction, which is great vaccines picking up really very nicely there but a flattening off of cases in the Netherlands. South Africa a bit of an increase in cases there. Ireland basically flat after going quite high. Again vaccinations should be starting to catch up in the next week or two in Ireland as they take effect. Um, United States um, well cases still going up in the United States as we know and there's been a recent increase in the United Kingdom as well. And I don't think you need me to tell you the cause of this. This is all caused by the, all essentially all caused by this Delta variant. So Australia, United Kingdom, Netherlands, United States, Delta variant problem, primarily, exclusively, really. Um, number of patients in hospital, which of course is a big factor. Canada, it is going up. Netherlands, it's level. Ireland, it's still going up. Ireland with relatively limited hospital capacity. UK gone up slightly recently, but clearly in the United States, as we know, um, cases with um, states with low vaccination rates are having a lot of hospitalisation. So really, that is the biggest concern that we've looked at there so far, really, the increase in hospitalisations in the in the United States. Now, what I want to look at now is the new data from the UK. It's published here. Uh, Nuffield Department of Medicine in Oxford, of course, there's the pre say of the study there and the full study here is not yet peer reviewed but here's the full study um, and I've read it and it looks pretty good to me <laughs> but it, it is from the uh, Nuffield Department of Medicine in Oxford so you wouldn't expect it to be a, a slapdash study and uh, basically it's consistent with the United States as we've said so let's look at that now look, look at that study now what it's saying so impact of Delta on viral burden and vaccine effectiveness against new SARS coronavirus 2 infections in the UK. So again, we're dealing with Delta era, um, Delta era data here, which of course is, is good to get. Now, the numbers here are 30, uh, 3, 384,000. Now, this is a combination. This is a collaboration between the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, of course, collects the best data in the country and the, uh, the Nuffield Centre of uh, Medicine in Oxford. So that is, uh, that's pretty good, a pretty good combination with the ONS data. They can make a really good analysis of that. And what really impressed me about this paper is, is what it doesn't say. It only, it only goes as far as the data allows. So let's look at that now, 221,000 households. So very good sample sizes, of course, by any criteria. Um, now they say this, this is the advice. Obtaining two vaccine doses remains the most effective way to ensure protection against Delta variant. That's given as a simple statement. Um, with Delta, Pfizer-BioNTech and Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccines still offer good protection against new infections. So good protection against new infections. Now, roughly, we know that after two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, the protection against infection is about 67%, although we believe that's going to carry on going up for a period of time. Uh, with the Pfizer, um, 
No, what was it? It was 82% with the Pfizer, wasn't it? 82% protection against infection. So they're saying good protection. That's actually what they mean. These are the latest figures. So Oxford AstraZeneca 67%, Pfizer 82% protect, protection against infection. Much higher levels of protection against hospitalizations, of course, as we've seen from the data from the United States. Um, but effectiveness is reduced through, compared with the alpha variant. So in other words, this vaccine effectiveness has gone down now. It would have been better if we still had the alpha variant, which of course has been taken over by the delta variant. However, Delta infections after two vaccine doses had similar peak levels of virus to those in unvaccinated people. So Delta infections after two vaccine doses had similar peak levels of virus. Now, this is a new phenomenon with the Delta variant. So what this is saying is, OK, you're less likely to get infected if you've had the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, although there's still something like a 33 percent chance with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, at least initially, probably gets better as time goes on. With the Pfizer, you're 82% protected, so there's still an 18% chance you're going to get uh, it's still infected. And if you are infected, so the one in five or so that might get infected with the uh, after the Pfizer vaccine, for that minority that still get infected, the viral loads that they produce are just as high as people that aren't vaccinated at all. So, for example, the Pfizer vaccine, you're about five times less likely to get infected, but if you do get infected, the viral loads that you can produce are basically the same as the unvaccinated person, is what that is uh, saying. And they do point out with the alpha variant, uh, peak viral levels in those uh, post-vaccine were much lower. With the delta variant, they're much higher. So remember, still with the Pfizer vaccine, five times less likely to get infected. But if people are infected, higher viral loads. So this means, is, is the vaccine protecting against uh, ongoing infection? Yes, it is, because in many people, they won't get infected in the first place. But if they are infected, then no, it's not. But that's still giving an 82% level of protection against infection in the first place is the important point there. Uh, but still an element of risk if people do have um, chorizal common cold type symptoms after two vaccines, particularly headache, runny nose, sore throat, sneezing they still need to get tested. Or, of course, any of the other classic features which are still on the government website. So um, fever, uh, persistent cough, difficulty breathing also would merit a test. But remember, a lot are presenting as common cold symptoms now. Two doses of either vaccine still provide at least the same level of protection as having COVID-19 through natural infection. This is interesting. So two doses of vaccine provides the same level of infection of people that have had the infection. So this is saying that there's comparable levels of immunity in people that have actually had the infection. That's probably about 18% of the people uh, in the UK. Um, so they have good levels of immunity, but two doses of vaccine give the same level of immunity as the natural infection, which is good. But the ones that do best, people who've been vaccinated after already being infected with the COVID-19, have even more protection than vaccinated individuals who have not had it. So the data we've got so far indicates that the people that are best protected got the natural infection, then got two doses of the vaccine. They have the highest levels, highest levels of protection. Now, what I immediately thought here was, well, what about people that have had two doses of vaccine and then get infected? Because if, if you've had two doses of vaccine, your infection is likely to be minimally symptomatic or, or asymptomatic, but you're being exposed to the virus again, so that's going to re-stimulate the immune system. And I'm assuming that people that have had two doses of vaccines and had the infection end up with much higher levels of immunity than people that just had two doses of the vaccine. But we're not told that. We, we don't know. That, that's, that's my supposition. It makes perfect sense. I'm sure it'll be true. But what this data is definitely being able to tell us is that people that have had the infection, then two doses of the vaccine have higher levels of protection than people that just had the infection or people that just had two doses of the vaccine. My hunch is that people that are exposed to the virus after two levels of vaccine will get a substantial boost from that. Um, but we don't we don't know. It, it doesn't tell us that. 
Two doses of Pfizer BioNTech have greater initial effectiveness against COVID-19 compared to Oxford AstraZeneca. Uh, but this declines faster compared to two doses of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So what they're saying is the Pfizer vaccine works more quickly, but doesn't seem to work for as long in terms of preventing infection is what they're saying. So that level I gave you there of 67% level protection for the against infection for the AstraZeneca and 82% uh, uh, protection against the Pfizer then that is after just a few weeks after the second dose, two or three weeks after the second dose. Over time, this one, the Oxford AstraZeneca level of infection, uh, protection against infection can actually go up and this one tends to go down a bit. So it's not a straightforward pattern. Originally, we thought that the Pfizer was giving better uh, protection, but we did say many times on this channel, it's probably just because of the Oxford AstraZeneca is developing uh, immunity more slowly, and that is turning out to be the case. So it means your levels of protection against uh, symptom against getting symptomatic disease, catching symptomatic disease after two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, are there after a couple of weeks after the second dose. But with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, it's taking two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight weeks to build up to full immunity, presumably getting well beyond the sixty-seven percent, which was at two or three weeks after two or three months, for example. So basically, I think that's kind of good news about both vaccines, really. And what they say is after four to five months, the effectiveness of the two vaccines is similar in preventing infectious, in preventing infections in the first place. So four or five months later, it doesn't matter what vaccine you've had, you're still enjoying the same level of protection. Where that's going to go after four or five months, of course, we don't yet know. Is it that the Pfizer vaccine is going to carry on uh, with declining levels of immunity and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is going to carry on with increasing levels of immunity? Probably not. I would imagine they'll probably stay both the same at reasonable levels after four or five months. But we, we don't know. The data simply not in. So uh, long term effects need to be studied of what these differentiations are between the Oxford and the AstraZeneca vaccine at uh, seven, eight, nine, ten months, a year, two years, three years, whatever. The time simply hasn't elapsed. Now, this really surprised me, this next point. The time between doses does not affect effectiveness in preventing new infections. I was very surprised by that. What we've believed for some time now is that people that had the two doses of vaccine close together had less levels of protection than people that had two doses of vaccine further apart. That is not what has been found by this data. So there you go. Um, the real world has proved us wrong. The time between doses does not affect effectiveness in preventing new infections. But there again, to be fair, this is not saying that the time between doses is not going to affect longevity of the vaccine response. It may be that people that had a longer gap between the two doses have greater longevity of immunity could be years we, we don't know and it's also not telling us the reduction in the likelihood of hospitalization it's simply not telling us that it's only the data only tells us what the data tells us and we have to be quite strict about that so the time between doses does not affect effectiveness in preventing new infections in the time span of the study so there you go so we're going to put a query as regards um, as regards prevention of hospitalizations with a longer gap and we're going to put a query as regards longevity of the immune cover as a result of a longer gap I suspect the longevity will actually be increased I strongly suspect so but we don't know because the data doesn't tell us younger people have even more protection from vaccine than older people so that is good to know that younger people are even more protected than Older people, older people still fairly well protected, although we've just seen from that data from the United States that vaccine does vaccine effectiveness does vaccine effectiveness against infection does go down in people in uh, long term care facilities in the States. But this is this is this is universal. I mean, young people always respond better to vaccines. This isn't surprising, really. That young people get higher levels of protection because they have a more active immune system. So where does this leave us in the UK in terms of third doses of the vaccine? 
Well, uh, Professor Peter Openshaw is one of the main brains on this. And he works, or in fact I think is pretty well in charge of, the new and emerging respiratory virus threat advisory group, NERVTAG. One of these appalling acronyms, but there you go. So um, this is their job to do that. Now he says this. We can't just look at the antibody levels and think that that equates to levels of protection. Of course not. It depends on very much on the other cells, the memory cells, the B cells, the T cells for the longevity of response. Looking at antibodies is only one simple proxy for relatively short term assessment of an immune response. The immune response is multi-layered. And uh, he also says this. It still seems that you get a lot of protection from these vaccines, even if the antibody levels have drifted down to some sort of stable levels for some time. And I'm still expecting reasonable, I'm still expecting good levels of protection against severe illness and death after a longer period of time. So basically what the UK authorities are saying uh, is that we don't have enough data yet to decide if we need a third dose. Now, Sajid Javid, Health Secretary, is expecting one, but he's on his own at the moment. The scientists haven't come along and said, well, no, we agree there is going to be a third dose needed. The scientists are saying that we don't have enough data to decide if we need a third dose or not yet, whereas the United States, from the data they have, are going ahead because of the reduction in um, people that still catch the virus even though there's still very good levels of protection against hospitalisation. So protection against getting infected, if we combine what we've learned from the Israeli data, the UK data and the US data, protection against infection goes down. Protection against hospitalisation so far, after basically eight months, is essentially maintained at the same level. And on the basis of that, it looks like the political thinking in the United States has decided it wants a third vaccine. But of course, that will have to be certified by the FDA and the C CDC. They're not quite there yet. Uh, the White House group, thinking group, seems to have gone ahead of the FDA and the CDC, which I must say is a little bit surprising. You would expect the, uh, the political groupings to be led by the scientific groupings rather than the other way around. But in the UK, the scientists are saying... We simply don't know yet. The data is being actively crunched as we speak. They are on this. But so far they're saying they don't know if we're going to need a third dose of vaccine or not in the UK. So that is where we are at with that. So that's pretty interesting. And of course, the, the implications for global vaccination and immune status are pretty obvious. You don't need me to spell those out. If it is that we need a, an annual dose of vaccine, throughout poorer countries it's very hard to see that that's going to happen given that many african countries for example are only at about two percent of their population fully vaccinated at the moment it's hard to see that the logistics will be put in place for a regular update but i'm hopeful it's not going to be needed despite the americans the the, uh, the white house group somewhat jumping the gun it has to be said we'll wait and see what the fda and cdc say on that but in the UK, we're simply saying we don't know yet, which we don't. So that is us. I thought that was uh, interesting studies. Good to see consistency in data between different countries because it means, I think that means it's actually reflecting the real science. If you do the study in one country, do a similar, not the same study, but a similar study in other countries and you're getting vaguely, basically consistent, basically, basically fairly highly consistent data with the same vaccines and the same virus, that probably means the method, methodologies are good Therefore, the data is valid. The data is doing what it claims to do. It is valid data and good for decision making. So there we are. Um, personally, a bit more encouraged than yesterday. Thanks for watching.